Hello guys, how's it going? It's your boy Voodoo Reads in the house and today I'm here with none other than Sheikh Shabir. Thank you so much for coming and <laughs> my pleasure. Giving your time is an absolute mm -hmm. honour. Before we get started, I would like to say that I was a massive fan of yours and still am. Uh, so I really appreciate this, uh, this opportunity that you've given me. So I know we're a bit short for time, but let's start off with something which is a lot, uh, which is a, a lot, uh, interested to a lot of people, which is science and religion. There are many uh, miracles within the Quran and a lot of Muslims have a hard time reconciling their personal faith with miracles that apparently go against science. For example, a virgin birth. How would you reconcile the two different approaches? Yeah, I want to say something first of all about miracles in general. Uh, the approach I take is that uh, God uh, is always actively involved uh, in, in the forming and shaping and continued evolution of the universe and, and us within it. So if we uh, think of an old um, uh, analogy that was made of how life uh, develops, uh, one might have said, okay, uh, where life is unfolding, the way uh, a movie unfolds uh, from a, um, a, a, a reel of already filmed uh, uh, set of, of shots. Frames. And, yes, exactly. So the frames are being played at rapid speed, we get the illusion of, of movement. And uh, we are just experiencing moment by moment the way God has already planned in that in that reel of film, which we haven't seen yet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would like to update that analogy and, and speak of uh, something like a, a Disney animated movie that uh, is, uh, is not a set of uh, films, but, but it's a set of files that, that are played one after another. I, I imagine it to be so anyhow. Uh, but at least we get the, the impression that um, now uh, the, the artist who designs these uh, frames um, could be designing them instantaneously. So, so we're seeing them as they're being designed and projected to us. Right. Uh, so, so that would mean then uh, that if God is like this, then, then what we would call a miracle is not God's intervention into life, like spoiling his initial plan and, and you know, scrapping things or uh, violating the laws of nature or anything like this. In that case, it would be that uh, God has made all of the frames up until our present moment, and the next moment will be a new frame, but that next moment uh, is going to be the sum of calculations based on everything that's going on. Some people are praying to God for one thing. Some people are praying to God for the opposite of that thing. And, and God is uh, going to make all of these calculations and give us the next frame according to his will, uh, but taking into, into consideration everything that, that he wants to accomplish for the next moment. Uh, so it's not uh, changing any of the laws of nature. It's just God's continual involvement uh, with the universe and its continual uh, unfolding. Yep. Now, within that framework then, how, how do we understand something like the virgin birth of uh, Jesus on whom be peace? Now, um, uh, w w with that framework in mind, I, I'm allowing for God to perform anything that we might call a miracle. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I, I wouldn't jump and claim that there is a miracle unless we have some good grounds for claiming that. Now, um, the, the stronger the, the miracle, the more good grounds we should have for that. Because, uh, you it's know, a bigger claim. Yeah. Yes, it's a bigger claim, so you need to have greater mm -hmm. evidence for that. Now, a, vir a virgin birth does not happen every day, and in fact, uh, yeah. our Christian friends think it only happened that once. Yeah. And uh, Muslims might be open to the possibility that this happened more than once, but, uh, but we don't know of other cases. Um, and now, uh, given that, that, that to be the case, it means that this is a very rare occurrence, one out of billions of billions of people yeah, who have ever lived on this earth. Um, and in that case, we should not assert that uh, such a, a, a kind of miracle occurred, uh, which would require a great deal of evidence especially if we do not have that. Now, what evidence we do have for, for the virginal conception of Isa a.s. Uh, is the Quranic story uh, of uh, the Annunciation to Mary. And uh, that story has been interpreted in the classical tradition to mean that uh, she um, did not have a husband and Isa a.s. was conceived uh, miraculously yep. um, by divine intervention just from his mother alone. Uh, however, as we know from modern science, this actually requires um, God's active involvement in this in, in, a, in an extraordinary way. 
and um, we should then ask, uh, is it really necessary to read the Quran in this particular light? Now, uh, I, say, I say this knowing that on the one hand, there are many Muslims who assent to this without, any, without, without blinking an eye. To them, it's easy to understand and easy to believe but that God did others, this. It takes a bit more. Uh, yes, yeah, some others may be very skeptical. Some people, uh, there are different kinds of people. Mm. I mean, some people are more rationally inclined. Some people are more traditionally inclined. Some people just accept things as they are and say, I, that's it, I believe it. God is powerful, he can do whatever yeah. he wants. Uh, some others uh, do not find things like this too easy to believe. And if we have many of these piling up, this could weigh heavily on the mind of such a person. And that could actually drive a person outside of Islam. Yeah. So uh, I want to explain Islam in such a way that even such persons who mm. are irrational in their outlook and, and they do not subscribe very easily to things like miracles yeah. uh, can find comfort within the faith. So I say that if such a person reads the Quran, uh, they, they might conclude that uh, the Quran is not clearly asserting that uh, Maryam salam, was a virgin at the time when she gave birth to Isa alayhi salam. So that possibility is there. That, that possibility is there. And how do we uh, arrive at that uh, as a possibility? You see, the angel comes and, and announces this to Mary, that you will have a child. And Mary says, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And the angel says, so it will be. When God decrees a thing, he only says to it be, and, and it becomes. Now, it's only a miraculous description here so far, but that's how the Quran describes things anyhow. If the Quran talks about rain, rain comes down by the command of God and, and as a blessing from him. But of course, we know that there's a process as well. And, and God actually describes a part of that process uh, in, in the 24th chapter of the Quran, how he sets the wind, the wind gathers up the moisture so, that then forms clouds. So, so just, just so I'm clear, when someone says, for example, um, Mary gave birth to Jesus and she was a virgin, you can be a Muslim and say Mary gave birth to Jesus and wasn't a virgin, and that is not compromising your faith. Uh, to me, if one can read the Quran in that way. But if one read the Quran and said, uh, you see, one has to be sincere to oneself yeah. and to God. Uh, if I, as a Muslim, read the Quran and I look at it and say, okay, obviously this means that uh, uh, Maryam was a virgin at the time, and uh, if I'm comfortable with that, that's, that's between me and God. Okay. But if another Muslim reads that and says, wait a minute, uh, why, why should we think that there's a virgin birth here? That, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't actually say that. And maybe from the time of the Annunciation, like Mary was true in saying, no more to touch me. Yeah. But uh, subsequent to the Annunciation, uh, things, have changed. Changed. things could have changed. So, I mean, my question is, the, this is one of the things that I was going through. I was like, I really value science and I value Islam. I thought there should be no contradiction between the two. And I used to sort of metaphorically or, uh, or f try to find a, a naturalistic or a uh, symbolic interpretation of miracles that did not compromise science. The one thing I couldn't get around was a virgin birth. And there were very few people who said what you were saying. But my question is, how did the prophets, the Sahaba, how do they understand virgin birth? Do they think the way we're thinking now? Or do they think, no, no, this is a virgin birth? That's, well, that's the question that mm, I was having in my head. Yeah, so two things about that. First of all, um, uh, they, like people sometimes uh, make Islam so complicated because uh, you know if, if we said we have to follow the Quran, yeah. uh, many of our non-Muslim friends would actually uh, understand that. So if we're inviting them, okay, come to Islam. Well, okay, what book are we supposed to follow here? It's the Quran. So it's mm -hmm. one book. Uh, it, it's short and sweet. Uh, it's definitive. Here, here are the two covers mm -hmm. and everything in between. Um, but what we make it so complicated, not only do you have to follow the Quran, but you have to follow the Prophet. And not only do you have to follow the Prophet, you have to follow the Sahaba. Not only the Sahaba, but the Tabi'in, and then the Tabi'in, and, and then, then the great scholars. scholars. And then you realize yes. Islam isn't this, Islam is it's, this. It's very broad, very yeah. complicated, very difficult to navigate yeah. through. So we need to sometimes simplify things and place things in, in order of their priority and importance. Okay. So yes, it is important to follow the scholars. Yes, it is important to follow the Tabi'in and the Tabi'in and the, tabi and the Sahaba and, and the Prophet peace be upon yeah. him. But, but things have to be uh, prioritized. The Quran is the primary document that defines the Muslim faith. Now, we have reports about what the Prophet peace be upon him said or did or approved, and those two become part of what defines uh, yeah. Islam. But we have to be cautious here because the Quran has been preserved in writing and the memories of many individuals from the very inception, mm -hmm. but not so the Hadith. Uh, the Hadith had to be memorized, but there was such a vast stock of Hadith that 
that very easy yeah. people could confuse one from another, one, uh, I mean, one to another. With regards and, to like virgin births and other scientific or, or other miracles that are in contradiction with science, we sort of, I mean, people nowadays think, well, let's go for, some people say, let's go for the interpretation that's naturalistic, so we don't even run into these conflicts between science and religion. My question is, did the prophet understand it that way, or did he understand it in the way, no, no, this is a miracle? Okay, so to, to answer that, I would have to have like a clear statement from the prophet, peace be upon him, speaking about this, like not, not only saying that... Uh, um, Isa a.s. was born of a virgin, but uh, it would have to elaborate like what is meant by a virgin. Uh, does it mean like um, at the time of her the Annunciation or, or oh, what? Yeah. But I'm not I'm not aware of uh, many hadiths dealing dealing with this uh, with, with with this particular yeah. question, or I'm not aware that there is a hadith that actually contradicts this uh, um, uh, approach to the Quran to say that okay. Um, she definitely was a virgin at the time of the Annunciation, uh, and, 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 would, virgin, yeah. well, and one might ask, okay, but why did she protest? Well, you know, if uh, she might have been about twelve or thirteen at the time, mm. and and if you say to a girl that young that she, you know you're going to have a baby, then uh, the girl might easily blush and say, well, <laughs> how can I have a baby? I'm not even married. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a simple type mm. of uh, reaction. So I'm I'm not aware that anything that the Prophet peace be upon him said that could definitively be traced back to him would contradict this view uh, and then if we go on now to include what the Sahaba thought about this and so on then this of course complicates the matter yeah, because a lot of Muslims yeah. say that you know to best way to understand the Prophet was to see how the Sahaba acted of course there's gonna be difference of opinion within the Sahaba but nevertheless mm -hmm. they understood Islam better than we can understand because they saw the Prophet do all the things that he was saying he was doing so which is why I said how did the Sahaba understand it but if you're saying that, you know, back, back to what you're saying, Islam is simple, you know, there's a primary text called the Quran, and yes, we have these, but that complicates things, and yes, we have the three generations of that, and then we have Imam Malik, and all, <coughs> but it gets more and more heavier and more complex. So are you saying that potentially every generation, a Muslim can read the Quran and with, without having to burden themselves with all the hadiths and all the sheikhs and all the scholars, and look and say, what did someone say a thousand years ago before I read this? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not advocating a free-for-all, and, and, and to do that would be uh, irresponsible. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is that uh, in, in any field uh, of endeavor, we recognize certain experts in the field. Mm. And we know that when one speaks outside of his uh, subject of expertise, he just speaks as a lay person. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. have any more authority than the lay person. Well, I, I so, mean, the scholars, if they were to interact, like for example, if you're a new graduate scholar, mm. does he or she have to burden themselves? Yes, you, you can refer back, but are they are their hands tied in interpretation? Because some sheikh a thousand years ago said, no, no, this is a virgin birth. Mm. But he's saying, well, it's science and how should he or she or Yeah, coach? so so I'm getting that, but I want to deal with this fundamental question as, uh, you know, yeah. what is the nature of authority? Mm -hmm. So now when we speak of the Sahaba as an authority, you're right. There, there are certain things that we credit the Sahabas for yeah. as authorities because they were there with the Prophet, peace be upon him, they saw him act and they were uh, the ones who are the primary reporters of what he said and did. Yeah. And there are certain things which may not have actually been reported in words, but which they understood naturally and... and it was nobody, a given. Yeah. yeah, it was a given. Nobody yeah. felt the need to actually put it in, in words. But then we should be careful not to credit to the Sahaba more authority than, than what um, they're qualified in. So their, their, their key qualification is that they were there in the time of the Prophet, yeah. peace be upon him. The revelation was given in their presence and there are a lot of good things said about them in, in the Quran. Uh, but no, we, we should not advocate that, that they had like a 20th or 21st century mindset. Of course. Maybe because they couldn't. They, they, they would have had like a pre-scientific understanding of our pre-modern understanding mm -hmm. of the world and how things operate and so on. Yes. And uh, there are certain things which people might have understood at the time and which were not... Uh, uh, necessary to correct at the time. You see, when, when God is looking down at the world and saying, okay, I'm going to reform these people, what, what am I going to do now? I'm going to send them through a revelation. Uh, but uh, if, if uh, you know, so many years ago I took a course uh, on, um, on, on writing, mm -hmm. and uh, part of the exercise within that course was to edit somebody else's writing. So now mm -hmm. the, the instructor says, well, you, you don't change everything because first of all, you're gonna ruin the confidence of the writer. And, uh, and secondly, that, that's just not your job. You, you just have to make some corrections 
uh, to improve it, but, but you can't correct everything if you're okay. editing somebody else's work. So God is going to make some corrections and changes to that society, but just to lift them to the next, lift level. To the next level according to his good pleasure, yeah. uh, what is acceptable to him, what he wants to accomplish here. So he's not going to change everything. You cannot change their mindset all altogether. Yeah. So some things are left as they are. So then, sorry, sorry, so we say yeah. Islam is a progression. It's the first step, not the last step. Mm, I, I would say that uh, think of the revelation from God as coming down vertically from, from heaven yeah. to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now think of that uh, tra re revelation then being transmitted to us over the, the ages as a hor horizontal line. Mm -hmm. So we have a vertical line, we have the horizontal line. Now when we are looking, we're, we're, from our perspective, we're looking back along that horizontal line to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. But we're also looking up of, um, uh, on the hypotenuse uh, to, to God from heaven and and we're being inspired in our thoughts and our ideas uh, continually by God uh, it's not that level of revelation which came to the Prophet peace be upon him uh, so we're benefiting from that revelation that came down vertically and was transmitted to us horizontally but we're also benefiting from our connection with God along the hypotenuse okay. and, and our understanding that has to be shaped by this entire triangle and uh, knowing the historical revelation like the way it came down and what it did at that moment of its impact and and also by the whole uh, understanding of it throughout history as sure. much as we can sure. study that and but but we're also seeking inspiration from God okay. knowing that God equips us with our intelligence and, and uh, our intellect and we have to use that intellect to understand uh, not only the the impact of the revelation in the first instance but how it was understood and transmitted to us uh, throughout the ages sure.